welcome to the What Home Means for Cats, working together to keep more cats alive and thriving. We are so excited to have all of you, and we have incredible um, cat-tastic experts tonight. We have Monica Friend and Tarrant, um, Maddie's Director of Feline Life Saving. Thanks to Maddie. And we also have Dr. Kate Hurley, Program Director at UC Davis Corret Shelter Medicine Program. Thank you both for being here. Good job, Casey. You got the pronunciation right. Yeah, you Good. did. You got, Glad you, to you do nailed it. Nailed all of it. Thank you, Casey. Um, thank you, Casey, sir, behind the scenes running this webinar. Everybody for joining uh, Maddie's Fund for making content like this possible. And um, the ever amazing, one of my personal heroes, Dr. Kate, joining us from, from California. Um, one of my favorite people to talk cats with. And uh, thank you all for, for letting us come talk about cats tonight. Um, we're going to talk about what home means for cats tonight. And we have moved as of 2021, really, into um, trying to simplify what home means for cats. And we have started, we, you know, we have a lot of acronyms. We have TNR, we have SNR, RTF, um, various renditions of all of those acronyms for community cat programming. And earlier this year, we made a conscientious decision um, as part of Haas and part of our community cat work groups that we needed to simplify it. And what we kind of came up with was the idea of just return to home Encom encompasses all of those community cat programming acronyms and the language behind it. And it makes sense to people, return to home. We're not returning them to a field, some mythical meadow that we just throw them out into while the sound of music plays in the background. Um, and shelter, neuter, return. What's the difference between that and TNR? What does TNR stand for? What's TNVR? And so we kind of said, let's just start using return to home. The public gets that. We have a lot of work to do to bring the public around to community cat programming and buy-in. And so we started talking about return to home. But even the word home can be a little bit confusing when we talk about cats, because my idea of a home for cat might be very different than your idea of a home for cat. Um, what is a home? Does it mean a house? Does it mean behind the nursery where the cat lives? What does home mean? So years ago, and Dr. Kate, maybe you remember what presentation this is from, but years ago, you gave a presentation and there was a slide in it that, that spoke to me. And the slide was this photo of a cat outside somewhere in the, in the grass but underneath it. And, and, and the slide essentially said, and I'm paraphrasing, there are enough homes for all of them if we respect the homes they currently have. And I remembered that and I took a photo of it with my phone <laughs> as I sat in the audience. Yeah. Um, I remember it for years now. Um, so there are enough homes for all of them if we respect the homes that they currently have. So what does home mean for you and why is that word important? Yeah, Monica, as, as, you're, as you're saying that, it's just come back to me that um, that slide was following on, uh, it was in a presentation that opened with a slide showing a sign that hung in the lobby of the very first shelter that I worked in. And it had a litter of five kittens and it said, pick one and kiss the rest goodbye there aren't enough homes for them all. And that was just the sheltering reality that I kind of grew up in. That was actually true at our shelter. We got to pick about one out of five. That was what we were able to find homes for. And so that was really the huge change in thinking for me was to understand there are enough homes for them all. If we look to the definition of home that is not the home that is exactly like our homes, but that is really the home that express what the cats need and what everybody in our communities understands to be home. And I was, I woke up happy this morning just thinking about being able to have this conversation. Um, I think this last year, you know, it's last, I don't know, 20 months, whatever, it's a year <laughs> and, and then some, um, really made us all think a lot about home, right? We got to see each other. We got to see like news reporters and celebrities all in their homes, all zooming from our homes. We spent a lot of time in our homes and we, we got to really see just like the different, the different ways that, that people live and also to appreciate like how important it is to be able to have a sense of well-being and safety in your home. 
but also to understand that that's different for different people and and for different creatures too and cats are such home associated beings right like they're always in lockdown right they're they're not going to work they're not going on vacay to orlando they're not going on cruises like they're home that is their that is their life that that really defines their existence and i think one of the other things that really came forward this year is how important it is to respect differences um just amongst people amongst cultures, but amongst all beings, right? Is to, to not try and impose our model of how to live and how to be and what's good and what's bad, what's wrong, what's, what, what's right, but to really try to understand like what's true, what's true for you and what, what do you need? You know, what is your reality? And not take our, our model and try and stuff it onto someone else's reality, whether that's another community member or whether that's a cat. So I think this is a super timely conversation to be having. So we, we I think we can all agree that like there, there's not enough resources to go around and, and rehome every outdoor cat, like definitively right. there or not, right? Um, what do what do we say to to people who want us to, who argue that well inside is safer and inside is better for every cat? Um, or at least the friendly ones. There's a whole lot yeah. of argument about, I support return to home for feral cats, but not yeah. friendly. Yeah. So, I mean, what do you, what do you say to like, well, it, every, every, if it can be adopted, it should be adopted. They're safer and better inside. Yeah. Well, I think there's part of that is what, how do we convince ourselves? Right. Because we are not going to convince anyone else. If we still have a like, Oh, you know, we are going to return this cat, but I don't, I don't really think it's a good idea. Um, so there's the, the, the internal conversation. And I think somebody just, I saw it flash across the chat. It's just to respect, we might think every cat is safer inside. You would also be safer if you spent the rest of your life locked in your living room, right? As long as you had workout equipment and stuff. But you don't, we don't always, we don't always choose safety. We choose what meets our emotional and physical needs. And, and there are some cats that do great inside. There are some cats, especially cats that didn't grow up inside, that don't want to be inside. And there are also some people for whom inside cats, it, it doesn't work, or that's just not where they are. And it's not appropriate to take their cats away and put them into a situation that more meets our idea of what cats should have. So I think there's there's that part of it. And I think a lot of us have had the chance to see how that plays out now when we're not trying to force cats that don't want to be inside cats into inside homes. And we see like, oh, there's a lot less peeing in laundry baskets. There's a lot less biting. There's a lot less howling at night when cats are able to give us a little more information about like, I don't want to be an in inside cat. Just let me be. Um, so there's that part of it of sort of convincing ourselves. Um, and then there's the part of it of convincing the people that we have trained for a number of decades now to think that every time they see a cat out and about in the world, they should snatch it up and bring it to us <laughs> um, without really recognizing either the inappropriateness for that cat or the, the risks it creates for the cats that really do need another home. Even if that cat is not the friendliest cat, but it's kind of a shy, 12 year old cat whose owner passed and it can't, it doesn't have a home to go back to. It needs a new home. So there's this element of like, we need to save the new homes for the cats that, e that really need them. Even if they're not as cute and shiny and fluffy as the cat that you want to bring into us. And we also need to respect that this cat has a home. This cat probably has someone, if it's friendly, all the more likely somebody loves this cat. Some kid might be crying herself to sleep about this cat. And um, just recognize like that's a story that we, that we need to tell for a while now um, because we told the, all the other story for a while. Yeah, and I think COVID brings this current too because you know, we are, yeah, we would all be safer if we all just stayed in our houses and lived in a bubble, right? right. Um, especially yeah. now more than ever, we're all establishing some sort of calculated risk in our lives. 
right now, right? Like yeah. it is a risk for me to go and pick up takeout or go to go out to dinner right now. We're all yeah. establishing what that calculated risk that we're comfortable with is right yeah. now. And I think and the conversation kind of parallels that because yeah, there's risks to cats outside. There's also risks to bringing them all to the shelter, which is mass extermination, right? Yeah. You know that. And there's also risk though to indoor cats, which I talk about all the time, but yeah. um, you know, gosh, you, you are this, you know, renowned feline PhD researcher. Um, and I'm forever going on about the US has like the highest rate of feline obesity and diabetes and cat behavioral euthanasia and all of these things that also carries a calculated risk, right? And I think the real risk is in trying to force a situation that isn't right, right? There are some indoor situations and cats that are a great match, just fine. There are some indoor situations and cats that are just not a good fit. And so we need to be able to assess individual situations. And I think that's the power of like, I don't know if you're familiar with, of course you are, but the, for the audience, the NACA statement on in cat intake really emphasizes that it should involve an individual assessment. What's going on? You know, does this cat, is there something really an unusual risk in this situation? And what should we do about it? Sometimes the best way to mitigate a risk is not to remove the cat, but to adjust the situation. For instance, spaying and neutering a cat reduces risks enormously in so many ways. And vaccinating it for pan Luke and rabies reduces a whole lot more risks. Whereas if you remove that cat, what's gonna happen? Another cat's gonna come in and there's a lot of risks associated with that, right? There's risks associated with migration. There's risks associated with breeding new kitties. And so sometimes in trying to remove the risk by removing a cat, we didn't change the situation. We didn't change the risk. We just put another cat at risk we could have changed the risk by spaying and neutering and vaccinating a cat and making a connection with perhaps someone in the community who, has, who cared about that cat. So I'm, I'm following the chat as we go here. And by the way, audience, we want this to be kind of a fun interactive thing. So feel free to chat and I'm watching and, and we're, gonna, we're gonna stay on top. And um, if you guys wanna talk, we can don't do that too, but, but uh, throw us your questions as we go here. Um, but so one of the questions is, is we're already getting into what, what if people don't want the cats there? Um, what do we do? How do we reach those people? How do we bring them aboard to change that situation and not, not uh, necessarily remove the cat? How do we manage that? And um, I don't know if anyone on, on this webinar caught the webinar that Daniel Bayes from the HSUS and I did a week or so ago, and she brought up a really good point that I had not thought of before. Animal control systems seem to be the only municipal system that I'm aware of in which the user, the citizen, the resident calls and tells the expert <laughs> what's going to happen. Like if my power goes out, I don't call the energy company be like, I need a new breaker installed and a new line pole put in. And they just go, oh, yes, ma'am, we'll be out there right. Like, no, they're the energy expert. They're gonna come tell me what the problem is and then fix it accordingly. But with animal welfare, I want the cat removed. I expect you to come do exactly that. So it's a odd system. That, that Danielle brought up that I found really interesting. But um, how do we, how, what do, how do we reach the, the, that, that last stronghold of people? I just don't want the cats here, period. Um, I wanna answer that in two parts, actually. Then the second part will be that last stronghold of people who just don't want the cats there. Um, if you think about, you know, sort of how you access other services, like it doesn't occur to you that you should be able to call the trash, you know, municipal waste management and be like, hey, I want you to come in my house and take my bathroom trash because it's like gross. Um, I dropped something in there. And I don't know what's going on. This smells funky. I want you to come in. And I don't want you to come on Fridays because I have a late thing on Thursday evening. So it's not convenient for me to put it out on Thursdays. And like, also, I want you to take my microwave <laughs> in my yard waste. <laughs> right. Part of that is because expectations are shaped by clear communication of what the policy is. So try to relieve exhaustion on your teams by reducing the number of one-on-one -on -one conversations that even need to be had by leveraging every communication channel that happens before that one-on-one -on -one takes place, right? So your first buffer should be your website and your social media. 
So everybody go, if you haven't done this lately, go type into the Google, found a cat, what should I do? Found a kitten, what should I do? And make sure that the information people are receiving is clear and tells them what to do in a way that doesn't brook a lot of like back and forth and encouragement of like, but if you call us and, and scream for 20 minutes, something else could happen. But just like, no, here's our policy, here's why. If you can build in even more buffers to get more information about the situation before a conversation has to take place, like a web form that people can fill out so they feel like they're doing something, ooh, like I'm interacting, um, and then you can assess the situation and decide who should get back to that person and how, that's even better. That's something that's hard to do when it's the middle of kitten season and you're busy and eviction moratoriums are expiring and you're stressed out. But if you haven't done it now, maybe put it on your agenda, do it in the fall. <laughs> Optimize your search engines so that the information you want people to have gets presented to them. So they don't have a lot of ego in the game by the time that they are sort of arguing with you. Second line of defense is your phones. So still, before they're standing in the lobby with a cat, optimize the phone conversation. If you have to partner with an outside group like a 311 system where they're not part of your team, they're not as motivated, see if you can offer them a training for why you're doing this so they're not rolling their eyes and people are hearing that in their voices. See if you can provide them with scripts or see if you can find another solution. Have a volunteer group that staffs a hotline and 311 just refers them. So take that out. Then, you know, so you sort of like get the easy ones taken care of that way. Then you have the really hard ones. The people who are, have a lot of expectations and maybe they just go through life this way. Maybe they are calling the trash company and yelling at them for coming on Friday and not on Thursday. <laughs> you know, truth is like we're at a kind of crabby moment in history where people feel like entitled and angry and when I feel sorry for us in sheltering I just think about Dr. Fauci um, and like we're not going to please everybody the best and it's not a mistake this is how change happens there's always a group of people who resist until the very last and sometimes have to just be forced into it with mandates or like that's the only option but it can be helpful the more you can offer sometimes people just want to be helped they want to be respected. So if you can offer them help, like a cover for their car or a cat repellent they can borrow or even just information, but like, or a friendly ear, that can help with some. If you need to empower your staff to make exceptions, see if you can do it in a way that doesn't get out on social media that like, if you just throw a fit and lie and say it's injured or whatever, or you're gonna kill it, then they'll take it in because you don't want that to get out and it will. So, if people make exceptions, make it in a way that feels like a one-time thing. Say like, hey, you know, I see that you've brought us cats before and we can make an exception this one time or I see that we actually have a walk-in appointment available right now, but we're not gonna be able to do this in the future. I'm making a note here that we were able to do this for you, but now you, you, know, you understand the system. So make it a one-time exception or if you must, what some shelters have done is like, all right, you know, we're going to try returning the cat to the location. Usually that solves some problems. If you continue to have problems, call us back. And if we can't resolve them on a second impound for $100, we can impound it as a nuisance cat and it won't go back. I'm not saying always do that, but that is something that people rarely actually take that up when it's offered as an option. Because the truth is spay neuter solves more problems than people think it, it's going to. It, once they actually experience it, but it can just like open the door of like, okay, here's some sort of other option to offer. I don't know, Monica, you probably have some other suggestions, but those were some of the points I wanted to touch on. Yeah, I agree with you completely. I think a lot, to, a lot of times people just want to be listened to. And so, you know, we need to put our listening caps on sometimes, but I think it's important. I'm watching the chat. I think it's important that we realize that we are the experts here. And so it, even though someone calls and says, this is what I want to happen, it's appropriate for us to, to assess that situation and say, I hear you. And what I hear is that X, Y, and Z are actually the problem. The problem may not be the cat. The problem is 
the, 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 the association with the cat, the digging in the garden, the spraying, the this and that. But the problem, we can alleviate those without removing the cat. And so it's, it's listening, I think, is 90% of the battle with those last holdouts. But my other mm -hmm. thought on this was that I don't waste a whole lot of time on people whose minds I'm not going to convince. Um, we have so many, so much work to do re-educating our communities on community cat management that mm -hmm. those people are, to me are like the, the lowest rung of what I'm going to spend my time worrying about because, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's very much, again, paralleling where we are as a society now with the last holdouts of, of policy and whatnot. And it's like, we've got yeah. to start with the masses and get critical flow. And then the last are either going to come with us or they're going to be left behind. But in the meantime, we can work on the bulk. And it seems to me as though when we explain community cat programming, the benefits to cats, when we keep reiterating that we are not saying less services for cats, we are mm -hmm. not saying we're just throwing cats out and not accepting them. What we're actually saying is better services for cats. Let me tell you how we're actually helping more cats than ever before. And in the, for the first time in our shelter industry's history, in a really species appropriate way, let me tell you how this is going to be really good for cats in the community. Mm -hmm. Both of those people come along. Um, and so what I've been advising, and I would love to hear if you agree with this, is, is when I, when people are, when shelters are rolling out community cat programs, I advise them like get ahead of it. Mm -hmm. When you're first starting, put out, talk about your community cat program, get ahead of it, put out press releases and blogs and, and talk about all the good work that is going to come from this and the benefit to cats and the benefit to communities and residents and get ahead of it. But mm -hmm. I get emails all the time, and I'm sure you do too, from shelter directors who are worried that villagers with pitchforks are going to come for them on social media if they go public with this. Mm -hmm. And my feeling is like, if you're not talking about it, it's almost like you're hiding something, you know, mm -hmm. like you're afraid of the work that you're doing. And I think we should be really proud of community cat work and we should believe in it, like you're saying, and we should, mm -hmm. yeah, I do want to talk about community cat program and I'm going to talk about it on Facebook every day because what we're doing is awesome and it's beneficial to cats so often. But mm -hmm. would you agree that like it, that the proactive is better than reactive or do, would you advise shelters just to kind of do as caretakers do and just kind of go quietly into the mm -hmm. night and take care of this cat situation? Um, or, or what do you think? Because given we know that the public overwhelmingly thinks that we should be rescuing every cat that we see on the corner. So how do we, how do we get that message across in the best way as, as well as mitigating the risk to the shelter? I think actually the public overwhelmingly sort of trusts shelters to kind of know what they're doing and like whatever we do. Even the thing we were doing before with the whole pick one, kiss the others goodbye, it was not an amazing system. Um, but the public was just like, I guess shelters know what's necessary and they wouldn't be doing that unless it was like the best thing to do. And whatever we communicate with a lot of confidence, they're like, well, you're the shelter, I guess you know. It's rescuers that are very engaged that think we should rescue every cat that can be found. So that's a reminder. Most of the public gonna do whatever we suggest with con when we suggest it with confidence. It's just those squeaky wheels are very prominent. And in, in the early days of return to home or community cat programs, there were some shelters that found it was successful to just pilot it quietly and just like quietly add some verbiage to their form that, you know, like I, I certify that I, the information I'm presenting is true and correct. And this cat hasn't bitten anyone to my knowledge in the last 10 days. And I realize this cat may be adopted, return to the location, found or euthanized, sign here, please. And not have a discussion. Um, but I think now community cat programs are so much better accepted. Like, so it's gone from beyond, become, being a cutting edge program to being like a standard of care in animal shelters. And I think it's appropriate to present it in a positive and proactive way. I think one thing is to not emphasize the newness of it, but just to say, this is what we do. It's not what we do now. This is not a new thing we're trying. This is not a pilot program, but just like, Here's the way we handle cats. And then if people ask like, oh, you know, I brought you six cats last year and it wasn't what happened. Then you can be like, yeah, how did that work out? You're bringing us another one. We're trying something new. But just in general, so it's like, here's some information about our amazing community cat program. And what's super cool that's come about in, in, in no small part, thanks to COVID is the entire Haas movement, which is unified so many shelters and rescues and organizations and nationals and all of them have come out and said community cat programming is absolutely best practice so every shelter can now also cite to that and say this isn't some newfangled 
you know, fly by night thing we're just trying here. This is established best, best practice. NACA has even put out the statement. Everybody is in support of it now. So shelters have that going for them, which is also maybe for the first time ever that we've gotten that level of uniformity um, saying this is what's best for cats. And it's also data driven, right? As someone who has, has, has procured um, so much of that data, this is very much data driven. We have all the wonderful stats from, from folks like you and, and your colleagues that we know that a cat's best chance of being reunited with her family is, is to go back home. Um, so if we, and we know that, right? You wanna confirm for us, Doc, cat's best chance of being reunited with her family. She's 10 to 50 times more likely to be reunited if we, if we put her back where she was found on the sidewalk, right? Yeah, and I think that's a really great statistic for the people who are concerned about cats, that, that 10 to 50 times more likely to be reunited with their families if they are left where they are, than if they're brought into an animal shelter. Um, that's one of the things for people to know who are concerned about the well-being of the cats. Another good thing for people to know is that in conjunction with uh, programs that were called SNR or RTF at the time, we saw not only a decrease in intake of both cats and kittens, suggesting just like less cats being born and born to suffer because kittens are more at risk of suffering and death than, than adult cats, we also saw a decrease in the number of cats picked up dead on the road. So it's not just like, like I was saying, we do better at reducing risks for cats when we help them to thrive in the situation where they are, with some exceptions, right? Where there's some evidence like, no, no, this situation is not, you know, like there's too many cats or this is too weird. This cat's not doing well. But in most situations, we actually reduce risk more by helping cats to thrive. Some studies have shown that the mortality rate is as low as 10% a year for cats that receive at least some care out in the field. That amounts to an average lifespan of 10 years. That's, you know, that's pretty good. Um, and that was um, not cats that were spayed and neutered even. So spay and neuter and vaccination reduces the risk even further. So we have, we do have good data that these programs can be associated with lowering risks. Now, people still like it's, but it's this cat. And like, I found this cat and I named him Fluffy and he has a really sad face. And like kind of his ear got chewed on a little bit. And like, I want him to like have a different outcome. And I, I think that's where it's really important to just like have that big consistent message. Also recognize it's emotionally exhausting to keep having those conversations. Like it's one thing to not like get after the holdouts on wearing masks or whatever. But if you're the one on the front lines at the grocery store is like, sir, you know, ma'am, can you put on your mask? I have to enforce it. <laughs> you're tired at the end of the day. So thinking about how you can emotionally support people and not have anyone have to have the conversation too many times. And as has been mentioned in the chat, the more you can give people that's nice and helpful and friendly and a perk, the happier they're gonna be. So we know you mentioned several groups of cats that we are all pretty much in agreement that we want to um, we want to bring into traditional adoption if we all can. Hopefully without a shelter stay. Hopefully we can, yeah. we can rescue the cats from the street and, and move them directly to home without a shelter stay. That is important. But we can kind of agree that there are some cats that that we want to fast track from from living outside to traditional adoption. Yeah, kittens, social friendly kittens. We all agree yeah. that when we can, which we can't always, but when we can, yeah. we want to fast track them to um, to traditional adoption. Yeah, um, they don't. They need help outside. They're not doing quite as well. They're not part of the ecosystem yet. They're highly yeah. adoptable. We're all pretty much in agreement. Like, yeah, if we can get those suckers adopted, great. Yeah. We pull them yeah. in. Um, injured and sick cats. No question. No one thinks we should be putting them back outside um, to fend for themselves. The sick, injured. There is the easy one of like environmentally sensitive areas, especially if they're mandated by law where, where, we, where we really and truly are, are either barred from returning them or there, there is some sort of exigent risk to, to the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, you've got hoarding cases or an unhealthy group of cats. Yeah. You know, there's just too many cats the environment yeah. cannot support. They're getting diseased and sick. We agree on all those, right? Those yeah. are the cats that we want to leave room within our shelter walls and in our foster homes and in our resources and our checkbooks to be able yeah. to bring those in and provide them good care. But if you are saying that a cat is 10 to 50, to 50 times more likely to be reunited with her family if she's lost, um, and this is kind of a trick question here, should we, what do, what do we do about cats that we suspect are lost, stray, or 
abandon we agree we can bring in because owner's not looking for them but what yeah. about lost cats or stray cats how do we know if a cat is lost or stray and if she's more likely to be reunited if we put her back do we bring her in and withhold her at the shelter do we put her back because we know the return to owner rate for cats nationwide is abysmal it's like four percent right. nationwide owner ain't coming to the shelter to pick up a cat so we know that's right. not happening so how do we identify those cats and what do we do with them right like it's just it's very unlikely that a cat that's out and about and doing fine is actually lost right it's like when you find a cat in your shed that you didn't know is in your shed <laughs> that's maybe like that cat got lost but still you should advertise that cat on social media and post some signs and talk to some kids because that cat is probably from the backyard that adjoins yours or down the street or something but there are situations and you really can't know the difference between a cat that's abandoned and a cat that's lost like truly lost and like it got into the postal carrier's vehicle and traveled across town and now it is lost um or the neighbors moved and they didn't make provisions for their cat and that cat is now kind of on its own but they'll present in a similar way they're newly in an environment you know they're newly without care and so they will present by like showing up at someone's house and sticking around without encouragement right so they're not coming just because like wow you know you i'm getting a second brunch here so i'm gonna like continue to show up but if a cat has shown up for some time without being encouraged by being fed then that's some evidence next thing is ask the person to try first ask kids post it on social media Paper post color. it on next door post it put a is this your cat collar on it and also notice like, is the cat, you know, beginning to be in poor condition? Does it have matted fur? You know, is it a little bit skinny? Does it seem really hungry? So we can look for signs that all is not well. This is not a standard healthy cat that's just on walkabouts and doing fine, but there's evidence that are, there's a particular issue with this cat. And it is really important to be able to identify those cats. Like God forbid my cat, um, you know, got abducted um, by a drone because he's so cute and dropped somewhere else, I would want him to at least appear on a website where I could look for him. And I would, you know, the, 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 the greatest thing would be if he could just like be found by somebody and post it on a shelter's website and I could see his picture and be like, well, that's my cat um, and go get him. But ultimately if people aren't able to do that, then that's the point for a cat to come in still recognizing like probably unless there's a microchip you can find and that was another good thing scan offer to scan for a microchip if there's a if there's not a microchip it's probably not getting home through the shelter because it probably got lost eight weeks ago or the people don't speak english or whatever but oftentimes when we're bringing cats into the shelter it really is for rehoming because we recognize they probably need to be rehomed the shelter is just not a good tool for getting cats back home yeah. um, unless it's by putting them back yeah, but there I, are some cats where like, well, it got lost from its home. Maybe if the person originally reported the cat lost back when it first wandered into that postal carrier <laughs> vehicle, there will be a record and you can get it back home. And there are ways to increase the, the, the likelihood that cats do get back home if they do come in. And, and I don't want to dismiss that. You know, there are shelters that have higher than a 2% reclaim rate and we should aim for that. But um mostly return to home is just a, a great shortcut yeah um i've been something i've been thinking about about a lot a couple last last few weeks we talk about the word you know community cat programming and of course we're talking about community cats cats who live outside when we say that but you touched upon the importance of that word community in your last response here i part of community cat programming to me is developing relationships with our with our people in our communities yeah in, in, right in this work, we have unprecedented opportunity to forge real partnerships with our residents right. and engage them so that when a new cat does appear, you're working with those caregivers, those trappers who then you now have a trusted relationship with you to say, hey, there's a new cat. I think this one is, is lost or abandoned or something's wrong because he just showed up and he did all the things Dr. Hurley just talked about. Yeah. So it's I don't think we can underestimate the value of people in the, this equation. And so when I now think community cat programming, I don't even just think about cats anymore. It's like community cat program, you know, like uh, it, it's people centric too. It's such a good point. And I think as much as we've talked about like wanting to educate community members, 
in reality, our education and our content with community members has reached a very specific subset, um, which underrepresents underserved communities. We know that, right? Less than 10% of residents in underserved communities have had any contact with an animal shelter, and if they have, it's often been negative. Whereas every cat that goes back home is an opportunity to make multiple very meaningful contacts within the very communities that can most be a valuable partner, because that's where the cats actually are, and they can help us reduce the risk for those cats, and also folks that we want to be able to support whether they're caring, you know, whether it's an old homebound woman who's caring for a couple of cats that showed up in the alley behind her house and like that, that, those cats are her good friends, but she's struggling to get food for them. We want to help in that situation, right? Or as someone who's like, well, their cat had a litter and now there's seven or eight cats back there. We want to help in that situation. And if you look at how many people have been users of your shelter, how many individual reporting parties have brought cats into your shelter, like, how many men, what percentage of your community is that actually? I think it's a good report to run if you have software that'll do it. Like count it up. Your shelter, you know, is funded equally by all taxpayers, by many different donors. How many people are you actually serving? With every cat that goes back into the community, you have the potential to serve multiple people with that cat. And in a way where our actions speak louder than words, like we can say spay neuter is important, or we can say, here is a cat that is spayed neutered. What is it like to live with this cat? What do you see about how it's different? That can really change people's minds and open their eyes to possibilities that they might not have been familiar with before. Yeah. You know, you gave one of my, possibly my favorite webinar of all times. You're, 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 yeah, you probably know where I'm going because I've recommended this to all my students, your, this webinar, which should have won some sort of webinar of the year award. But, <laughs> We've talked, uh, and, and this is the other big one that we that we get all the time, and you know where I'm going with this by now, but so we've talked about what home means for cats, and so how do we balance that with also respecting home for wildlife and home for birds? How does everyone listening, how do they, how do they manage that? Yeah, and we have to take the butt out of that idea. How do we respect home for cats, but also respect home for birds? and turn it into an and, because here is the thing, like this was the news flash that changed my whole way of thinking about cats. There is nothing we can do as shelters that is disrespectful of cats' homes that will be of benefit to birds. Because where there is a home for a cat, whether it's in somebody's home, or whether it's there is a food source and some habitat that the cat is accessing, a cat will access that home. That home will be full, filled by a cat. And when we remove a cat, whether it's we take someone's, you know, someone's cat went on walkabout and we took it to the shelter and it never went back home, well, they'll probably get a new cat. That cat also won't be microchipped, probably won't be spayed and neutered, it might not be vaccinated, it won't be kept inside. There won't be a conversation. They'll get a new cat. If there's a cat in an alley behind my house and we take it out, but it was accessing a food source and we didn't talk to the person who was putting food out because someone else brought that cat in, that food will still be there. And another cat that's in that alley will have a larger litter of kittens and we'll have even more cats than before. So what we can do when we realize that removing cats doesn't support birds and wildlife in the homes that they have, we can help mitigate the harms associated with the cats in the homes that they're already in. When we spay and neuter a cat and she's not having kittens, we reduce the amount of toxoplasmosis in the environment and that's good for wildlife. The fewer kittens that are born or fewer cats growing up and preying on birds. Cats that are spayed and neutered get fat and lazy. <laughs> they don't travel as far. <laughs> We can have conversations then with people who are feeding cats and ask them to feed only the amount that the cat eats in a reasonable period of time and keep the area clean and not attract additional cats and more nuisance wildlife that also has a negative impact on native species. So there's so much that we can do or when we help somebody who's low income get their cat spayed and neutered, well, if they live adjacent to a sensitive ecosystem, a lot easier to keep your cat inside if it's neutered, 
right? Or if there's not seven of them. <laughs> so lots of ways that we can reduce the risk associated with cats. When we let go of the idea that we'll solve the problem by pulling them all out of the habitats that they, they have. And um, Monica, I was actually giving this webinar before this research came out where I was talking about this impact of removing cats and how they just like, they go back to the carrying capacity environment. But even after I started talking about that as a theory, there was research done where, um, this was in, in Tasmania, I think, where there's like really vulnerable ground dwelling species. So they're invested and it was hardcore. They were killing up to 30% of the cats that were present, but it wasn't all of the cats. And they actually tracked how many individual cats were present before and after they killed 30%. And they found, they thought maybe there would be 30% fewer cats. And it doesn't matter if you kill them or you just remove them, you could rehome them. They're gone from the environment, right? But you didn't remove the food source. And you know what they found, but not everybody here might know. They found the number of individual cats present increased by 75 to more than 200%. More than double the number of cats present because cats were removed. They caught the stupid, the brave, and the hungry. They caught the most dominant individuals, and it opened that environment to new immigration. They actually compared it to areas where they hadn't removed any cats, and there was no change in the population at those areas where there was no cat removal. And after the removal ceased, the population dropped back down to baseline. So actually, by removing cats, we have been disrespecting the ecosystem, and we have been increasing the harmful impacts of free roaming cat populations. That's really such important to recognize. Movement. Yeah, and I, I absolutely love the, the simple way you put it of this is not about cats, but birds. This is about cats and birds and, and community and everybody together as one and what's best for everybody it doesn't mean one has to suffer at the hands of the, of the other, right? Right, yeah. if there was a thing that, that could cause cats to suffer, but it would help birds, that would be a really difficult thing for us to figure out what to do about that. As people who probably most people here really care about all species, and that's very common. But luckily, you know, in a way, there isn't that thing. There is no way that we can help birds by removing cats through the scale that shelters can reasonably achieve. You know, we can achieve, we can pick one, you know, little area of habitat and work with other groups in concert to say like, let's really try and keep cats out of this very important habitat. Yeah. Let's work with the feeders um, around to reduce the number of cats. Let's not return cats right here. But in a broad sense, nothing we can do in terms of removing cats. This, this, this leads me to my next one. So I talk about this all the time that the way we house and shelter cats in the US and North America is really different than the rest of the world right? What yeah. does home look like for cats around the rest of the world, not North America? Well, I think it's, it's great to, to think about what do shelters think home should look like. Mm -hmm. That's really striking. I remember being at a cat shelter in the UK and somebody was applying to adopt a cat, but they lived on a busy road, so they weren't going to be able to let the cat outside. And the judgmental staff of the shelter were like, well, maybe you should think about getting another pet like a guppy that's more suitable to living indoors because we do not adopt cats out to homes that are not able to let them outside. Like they were so, they were as convinced as I ever was when I was a young judgmental adoption counselor <laughs> that thought all cats should be inside, um, that all cats should have access to the out of doors. So that's a little bit of perspective on terms of like the things that we have taken as a given are not a given. They're not a given. Yeah. But I think even more profound is to think about like, there is every possible perspective from cats should be worshiped as in my house and in some cultures to cats are like wild animals, to cats are dirty and kind of scary. And if that is present in any culture anywhere in the world, that's the beauty of America. Like I'll be verklempt actually about that. It's one of the things I love about America is we do have every culture in the world is here. Every kind of community, every kind of belief is here. And the way that we can 
really best be of service to that reality is to give ourselves the time and the permission to open our eyes and really, really listen and really see. So without judgment, like what, where are you coming from? What is your belief? And, and for, for people and for cats, really to be able to see with those kind of open eyes. It, it's such a good point that, that you know, we, we, you touched on the NACA free roaming cat statement that, that, we, that we wrote earlier this year. And we talked in that statement about how the indiscriminate removal of cats really disproportionately affects marginalized communities. Um, and it, it, our, our talk about the different ways different cultures manage pets, it, it's, it's very different. There are entire communities where outdoor pets are the norm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so um, explain to us how, how, is, how, do, how does this indiscriminate roundup of cats, how is it disproportionately <laughs> affecting those communities and marginalized communities, low income communities and communities of color and, and, and things that are a little, you know. Well, maybe let's talk about the opposite. Um, <laughs> how does return to home better help us serve and engage with marginalized communities, communities of color, communities where people speak different languages. Like, I forget how many languages are spoken in Los Angeles, for instance, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. When cats come into the shelter, in order to get their cat pack, people would have to, you know, like be familiar enough with that particular system, which is really based out of the RS, the Royal SPCA and the UK and sort of an imperialist model. <laughs> You would have to know that, that that's a possibility that like if their cat is gone, it could have been taken by somebody to a building that has a bunch of cages in it where the cats go. And if you don't come within a certain amount of hours, somebody else gets your cat, best case scenario. Whereas when you return the cat, the cat goes home to wherever, you know, it doesn't matter what language is spoken. The cat goes home to where home is. And the cat herself or himself carries some information of like, oh, shaved, <laughs> there's a scar, so ear tip, that, and then you can actually put flyers in the area with that cat, that if that person doesn't speak the language on the flyer, maybe they'll talk to a neighbor who speaks the language on the flyer, it really is community-based, the cat leads you into the very community where the cat is coming from, and where the people live, and that can be the spark of a conversation of like, oh, you know, in your culture, cats live outside, well, you know, let's talk about some of the considerations there. How could you make that safer? Or, you know, if you, now that the cat's neutered, he'll roam less, or maybe you want to bring him indoors at night. And like, this is kind of a big road here. So you can start having those conversations and building those bridges in a way that like it would never work waiting around at the shelter for people to come in and ask you the question, right? The cat is your emissary to make all those bridges, however many dozens or hundreds or thousands of cats you return, every single one is a bridge to a community that by definition that cat came from. I think that's one of the big takeaways for me this evening is that when we talk about community cat programming, maybe that's the next thing that we need to embrace is that the community and community cat maybe doesn't just refer to the cat, right? It's I community. Love, I love community that. almost come yeah. cat programming. Yes. Yes. Right? I, I really love that. that. I think that is the big aha for me. Yeah. Um, well, we've got 10 webinar. minutes left and there's all bunch of questions. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to toss them back and forth between us, doc. Um, callers for animal services. This is from Mandy, or, who, who was nice enough to put it in the Q and A from us. Callers for animal services may accept having the cats returned, but they still want field officers to actively trap cats, et cetera, which is currently beyond the shelter's bandwidth. What specific services do you recommend should be provided by a municipal shelter? So I can tell you what I learned as part of, of my job with American Pets Alive and Haas in working mm -hmm. with um, all these, these amazing shelters and rescues across the organization and looking at taking a hard dive into their data and their staffing mm -hmm. and their volunteer levels and their community cat programming. The shelters that I've seen that I'm working with that are still in August, still have empty cages in the, in the cat rooms and who have the highest live release rates and the lowest intake um, are the ones who have transitioned reallocated some of their resources to this new model of cat sheltering and have said, instead of, instead of necessarily paying the animal protection officers to go out and pick up cats, 
or paying all the kennel attendants to clean cages all day long or feeders to feed the neonates all day long, we're going to maybe move them over to uh, forward facing proactive services like more TNR, like actually maybe now we can pay officers to go trap cats where they need to. So this is what I talk about when I say we're not providing less services for cats. We're saying reimagine services for cats. And if we stop taking them all in, impounding them, making them sick, and then ultimately euthanizing them, it frees up a whole lot of resources. So maybe then there are resources to go help in those situations where you don't have someone who is physically able or wants to go trap for TNR return to home purposes. What do you think, Doc? Um, I think like big picture, that is absolutely our solution is like, get out, get upstream, get ahead get out in the community before the problems have sort of landed in the shelter. I think in the immediate, the other thing that COVID taught us was how well shelters can do when they hone in with a laser focus on the things they must do. And I, we've been talking on our team about sort of like a, and I've seen some versions of this in different ways, like a, a sort of target where like the very center is the thing, like the most important thing to do. And then when you're doing that, and it's within your capacity, you go to the next ring. And when you're doing that and it's within your capacity, you go to the next ring. Because always when you go beyond your capacity, all capacity shrinks. If you don't have capacity to send field officers out to trap, and as a result, um, cats are coming in that don't need to, and as a result, the shelter is filling up, and as a result, the cats are getting up a respiratory infection, and as a result, your medical team is swamped, and as a result, then the foster cat kittens aren't coming back because they get sick. And then they can't get spayed and neutered and then they get to be 16 weeks old and can't find homes. Like it's so easy to trigger that negative cycle by going beyond capacity. Whereas in COVID, when we got within capacity, it was like, oh, now we have time to like do the training so that the foster people don't need to come in. They can just like watch the training online and we can, you know, provide materials for people to coexist with cats so they don't have to call us to trap them all the time. And when disasters happen, we can just accommodate the cats that are and dogs and horses that are displaced by the fires without having a giant crisis come up. So in the middle of that ring, center of the target, in my mind, and this is from when I was actually a field officer, we had, we had priorities from A through M. And so A, top priority, human life is at risk. Dog is out like mauling kids, kids like dangerous dog, horse on the freeway. <laughs> right? Human life is at risk. Very next ring, animal life is at, you know, animal health and safety is at risk. Sick, injured, victims of cruelty and neglect. And for a lot of public shelters, that's it, <laughs> right? That's the core that they can do. And if that's where you're at, especially if you're with the 87% of shelters that are understaffed right now, according to the latest research that I saw, do that, do it well, and leave space for your community to step into the gap. If you can, next level is to provide solutions for animals who the homes can't keep them and they need to be rehomed. Kittens need homes because they just got born. Ideally, that doesn't happen by coming into the shelter, but you know that is an important function of shelters that we serve. At the same time, I guess like these two rings are stacked on top of each other of investing in your safety net programs to help people and animals exist in the community. And one of my favorite things about community cat programming is like you don't have to start with all of it right away, right? You start where you yeah. can and you do what you can and, and it is important, but I think that letting people fill that need is so important and that includes being transparent about what the need is right inviting those yeah. people to be part of the solution and making it easy yeah. for them right um there's a couple questions i want to tie together from the q a um talking about hey we don't have the resources where should we start coupled with we're really rural there are mm -hmm. no resources right how in the world do we even start and so yeah. i actually cut my teeth and got my start and as a, as a as a feral cat advocate as a community cat lover um in rural illinois and i mean rural rural um no services what there wasn't even animal control um and mm -hmm. so i feel that question deeply and um my my advice to rural communities as someone who has lived that is you are still a valuable resource the rural community is a valuable resource and you have things that urban 
more moneyed, more resourced shelters also want. And I learned this, I couldn't adopt my kittens to save my life in rural Illinois. I had barn cats and farms out the wazoo. I didn't have a single veterinarian I could take them to. So what I did was start driving them down to downtown Chicago, 150 miles away until I had van loads of them. And I partnered with a shelter down there who went, wait a minute, you have barns, you have farms? How about mm -hmm. we spay and neuter all your cats for free? We'll take those kittens. Sure, no problem. We can adopt them all day long. Can you take these feral things and like get them a barn home or something? And I went, yeah, all day long, I can adopt barn cats, mm -hmm. right? So you still have, and maybe, and then it was chickens and pigs and goats. Mm -hmm. And like all of a sudden I became the, like the most popular little rescue in Illinois with every big moneyed, wealthy Chicago organization begging to do things for me for free if I would just take these damn chickens, right? Um, which I could do all day long. So partner. Partner with other orgs and don't discount your value. You have a resource and yeah, you may, you're gonna have to drive. You're gonna, you're gonna have to do some lake work. Um, that's one option. Um, uh, yeah, I would, I would, I think that's what I've seen work as well. And I guess one other thing is like, remember that on a daily basis shelters take in between like one in ten thousand and one in fifteen thousand free roaming cats upon the land um, and you know so put it in perspective we coexist with cats with raccoons with squirrels with rabbits and like oftentimes they do stuff you know battling with a squirrel right now over my bird feeder um, and it can be helpful just to provide informational resources on how to coexist, how to keep the cats out of areas you really don't want the cats in. And if you can offer even a few spay neuter surgeries, oftentimes by arranging transport, perhaps one weekend a month, that can, I've seen a lot of programs start that way. Um, and if there is a veterinarian anywhere within striking distance and you can fundraise them to, to send them to a high volume, high quality spay neuter training might be a fun thing for them to do. So that one might be something to incentivize something um, more local. Yeah, um, we've only got a few minutes left. Um, I wanted to, I see Kimberly Freeman, one of my favorite <laughs> people in the chat. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't let you all know that Kimberly and I are gonna be doing a webinar soon. We don't have the date picked. But on the topic of that abysmal return to, to owner rate and, and returning how, uh, and lost cats, what do we do about lost cats? We have a very dog-centered RTO system in this country and a system that works pretty good for dogs. Um, but our return and our lost cat system um, is, is really bad. And Kimberly and I are going to be doing a webinar um, on, on lost cats and how return to owner and lost found dogs and cats um, really uniquely applies to cats and is totally different than dogs. And that's gonna be coming up soon. Um, Casey, do, did I miss any questions that we have two minutes to try and get answered? The chat has been hot and heavy here. The only one that I am seeing um, that I feel like could be good to answer, you kind of talked on this a little bit, but the age of kittens that you all think are okay to put back. Um, I've heard different answers, everything from three months to a year and everything in between. Do you feel like there's a hard and fast answer for that? There's not a hard and fast answer about anything to do with a cat. Um, but we have aligned Haas and Ampa, and we have aligned with Million Cat Challenge, which defines kitten as six months. So kitten super highway under six months, but that's not the socialization window, right? They're, they're, they're long since either sassy or, or socialized by six months. But it also is, to me, very, very dependent on the resources of the shelter. So if you can take in the social, easily adoptable, non-ecosystem acclimated kitten under six months and, and fast track it to adoption, great. If you can't, if, it, if it's, you have to consider if you are realistically able to get that kitten socialized. And I don't mean by putting it in foster for two years and letting it live under the bed. Can you flip that kitten? If not, then the, the sometimes, or if you just don't have the resources, period, then we also realize that you're, you're, you may not be able to take in every kitten under six months, and it's okay to put them back out if otherwise. Um, hard and fast rule for me, if there is one, is spay neuter weight. Right, Doc? Or what would you think? Uh, a below spay neuter weight, really try not to take them in yeah. um, if they're going back. But one thing I would say is, yeah, it depends on shelter resources in general under six months they go back but if they're older and they're a single cat and they're friendly considered like that might be some kid's pet <laughs> so 
do, you know, as they get older, try and get more clear on evidence that the cat is truly uh, unwanted, unadapted to the ecosystem, not some kid's pet that just came into the shelter and would benefit from going back. So you might want to put that one back. And then like, if it turns out, oh, no, no that was an extra cat. You'll, you can get that information and bring it back in. And on the other end of the spectrum, if you're like, oh God, I don't feel, I feel uneasy about this, but we really don't have the capacity to adopt out these four months old or these three month olds. You can make more effort to identify a caregiver at the location of origin. So it doesn't have to be black and white always at five and a half months, you put it back. Um, or at three months, you just toss them back out there. You can sort of evaluate the individual situation and try and tailor it a little bit. That's great. Thank you both so much. I, I think we're out of time. Um, yeah. Kristen put a comment in there um, in the chat. It is, I do learn something new every single time. I'm sure there's plenty of people on this um, on this webinar that are thinking the same thing. If we didn't get to your questions, we will make sure to document those and either Monica or Dr. Hurley will respond to you and get your answer for those. Um, and we'll be doing a recap. Um, if you if you want to send this recording to someone, you'll be getting that in a few days um, afterwards since you signed up for this webinar. Thank you all so much. Thank you, everybody. What a privilege, what a joy to be able to talk with you about this, Monica, and how far we have come for cats that we actually get to have this really rich nuanced conversation instead of just like how it was when I started of just like pick one kiss the rest goodbye like yeah as, as what an achievement we're, yeah as we're all struggling right now with staffing shortages in the middle of kitten season maybe reflect on that that my yeah. god we, we have come so far for cats and we got a long way to go but damn it we're getting there um and and the changes that we're making now are unprecedented and everybody on this call is a part of it and yeah. uh, i couldn't be more honored to work with this entire crew and everybody on this call um we're out of time please join us on maddie's pet forum dr kate and i are there every single day we'll pick up this conversation there we'll answer all of your fun questions and more um and you can also tell us what you want to hear about next so i hope to see you all on maddie's pet forum thanks to maddie for hosting us um thank you casey and everybody at ampa for being our moderators this evening thank you to one of my personal heroes dr kate hurley thank you thank you everybody thank you have a good night everyone thank you so much <laughs>